always got to remember that. Um, so we'll go ahead and and start talking today by going over some of the quiz questions. Hang on, I'm having. There we go. Um, and uh, you know, feel free to slow me down and ask for more questions if you like. Um, so to start, we did the first couple problems from the from the homework in in class, and remember that you only needed to do um, you only need to do show me the final product for those sequence of reactions. But again, it can be very helpful um, to to do more than that. And so, I, you know, while I'm not in not necessarily telling you guys it's a good idea to to waste paper, it is a good idea to make sure you give yourself enough room. Um, so more pages is usually better than less pages. And I think most of you guys figured that out. So let's look at the assignment. Were there any that stuck out to you guys in particular um, that you wanted to go over specifically? And then I'm just going to sort of pick and choose at random to, you know, glance at them and do a couple of them. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing here. Um, I can put a key up later that uh, you guys can check uh, and you guys can can see the answers too. I'll leave some feedback when I go through and grade your your guys um, submissions. So for starters for this first one. We did A, B, and C in class. D, we have two similar steps. So we're starting with acetylene. So we have two acidic protons. Pull the first proton off, put a methyl. Pull the second proton off, put an ethyl. So that right there tells us that it's that we're going to have methyl, carbon, alkyne bond, second carbon, then an ethyl. So five carbons in a row with the triple bond between carbons two and three. So let's open it in a different program so I have more room with it. All right, so and a lot of times it's helpful to start by drawing the triple bond and then add on to it. So there's our ethyl group on one side, there's our methyl on the other side. And it says sodium in liquid ammonia, that's our dissolving metal reaction. And remember that specifically was the one that, that's gonna leave it as, an, as a partial hydrogenation. So we're going to turn it into an alkene, but this is the, the mechanism that gives us the trans alkene. So we're gonna get trans, to pentene. So that molecule. Anything else on this on this first one? Some of these ones that aren't written as a chemical reaction can look a little bit tricky. Um, key is just recognizing what the reaction is. It's one pentine, and this is reacting with, this is our hydration that follows Markovnikov rules. So we're starting with one pentine. One, two, three, four, five. We're going to turn this into a double bond and add an OH on the more substituted carbon. But then remember it's going to then rearrange itself. So it wind up with the final product would look like like two pentone, pentanone. Pentanone. 
because when you get those those enols, they're always going to rearrange themselves to make an, a carbonyl. So the key with this one is just knowing which carbon to put the carbonyl on. And so acid catalyzed with mercury, those are both clues from alkenes that tell us it's the Markovnikov case. Right, if this was hydroboration, we'd be making the aldehyde instead. We put in the carbonyl on carbon one. Um, if we've got this reacting with two equivalents of anything, it's going to mean it's the same reaction twice, right? So C and E are both going to give you, C is going to give you two bromines attached on the more substituted carbon and two hydrogens attached on the less su substituted carbon. So it would give us 2,2-dibromopentane, two equivalents of Br2, and carbon tetrachloride is just the solvent. When it's at, anytime it says in, that's a clue that you're just talking about a solvent there. So C would give us 2,2-dibromopentane. E would give us 1,1,2,2-tetrabromopentane. Because remember with these bromines, with Br2 being added to a pi bond, we add a bromine to each side of the pi bond. Um, G is hydrogenation. We just get regular pentane. Here's our, our anti-Markovnikov reaction. So this would give us one pentanal, which is going to look like that. And then frequently you do see a lot of textbooks will draw in that other that hydrogen, even though it's not technically part of skeletal structure. Um, anytime you've got one equivalent of something, we just do the reaction once. So one equivalent of HCl, we break one pi bond and put a, a chlorine on the more substituted carbon. So that would give us two chloro one pentene. And here we got, we're going to use our acetylide as a, or our, our alkyne as a nucleophile to go through substitution reaction. So we'll get, we'll go from one pentine to two hexine in F. How are we doing so far? All right, so these syntheses are not, some of them are not too tricky. B is not too tricky. That's just our anti-Markovnikov hydration of an alkyne, but we have to get to an alkyne first. Um, and these are one of the places where it's really helpful. There's a really good figure from compound chemistry. You can think of, of organic synthesis as being, um, yeah, there we go, as being a map. And so this one's drawn it as a, as a subway map. Um, no, that's not what I want. Or my Zoom toolbar keeps getting in the way. Um, where you can basically think of the different functional groups as being stops on this subway map, right? So if you want to make an aldehyde, we only have one reaction that makes an aldehyde. And that one reaction for us that makes an aldehyde starts from an alkyne, which is, that reaction is not even on here. Um, so I'm more using this just as a, as a way to think about it. Think about what are the different possible ways you can make an aldehyde. Well, we won't, haven't covered aldehydes yet, right? we only have one reaction that makes an aldehyde. And that's our anti-Markovnikov from an alkyne. So that tells you that regardless of what else you need to do, you need to take what this starting molecule and turn it to an alkyne. 
if once you turn it to an alkyne, we can do an anti-Markovnikov reaction to make the aldehyde. So these multi-step reactions, it can be helpful to work backwards because that allows you to say, okay, I need to start from, if I'm going to make, oops, if I'm going to make this compound, I need to start from this compound. And one, two, three, four. Yeah, so there's four carbons in a row as an alkyne. So this one butyne can turn into this aldehyde product. So then how do we get here from an alkene? Well, we only know one reaction that makes alkynes, right? We only have one option to make an alkyne, and that's excess NaNH2, right? And that that's really good at pulling off halogens and turning that back into a pi bond, basically forcing it to go through an elimination reaction. So if we need to make an alkyne, we need to do that twice. So we need to start from a molecule that's got two halogens on it somewhere. They don't have to be attached to the same carbon, although sometimes they are. So we could get, we could make this, this compound or that compound. And either way, we could take either of those and we can and we can turn it into the alkyne. It's the same reaction either way. So how can we get to one of these from our starting material? Were these synthesis ones super easy or super hard? I never know when people aren't, when people don't talk, if that's because nobody has an answer or because everybody has the answer. They were difficult. They were difficult. I this is this takes a little bit of practice to be able to see this sort of moving backwards approach. Um, if you think of it as I only have one reaction to get to this specific functional group, it kind of limits your options. And that's when that working backwards approach helps. Um so how did we get here? Cody, were you gonna say something? Yeah, <clears throat> although looking back at my notes, I see I screwed this problem up, but I think you'd use uh, Br2 and uh, carbon tetrachloride. Yeah, and so then... we can do, we can take an alkene, and it, if we expose an alkene to just HBr, we do that hydrohalogenation, right, where we put the hydrogen on one side and the bromine on the other. But if we take an alkene and we expose it to the halogen gas, either chlorine gas or bromine gas, in ideally in carbon tetrachloride, um, then that adds a bromine to each side of the pi bond, right? So we would get, um, so if we started from, and I'm gonna try to give myself enough room to show this properly. So to get from compound one to compound two, we take our starting material and we expose it to Dr2 and if you don't put in carbon tetrachloride, that's not the end of the world. If you just put expose it to Br2, it's fine. That gets us from one to two. Then to get to three, we'd want to do a double elimination, right? And the only way we had of making the alkyne was we have something with two halogens on it and we're going to expose it to excess sodium amide. 
right? That's going to pull one bromine off to make to go through the elimination reaction and make an alkene. Then it pulls the other bromine off to turn that into the alkyne. And then at that point, we could also we would technically be left with a negative charge with a, as a terminal alkyne. So we do usually want to follow that up with water. Um, basically just to protonate and get rid of any leftover amide ions that are left and that protonates that alkyne. And then last but not least, to get to four, to get to our final product, which I can't scroll down or all my annotations are gonna be in the wrong spot. So just remember we're looking, we're talking about getting to that aldehyde We'd want that to react with um, that the dialkyl borane with that usually right as Br2H. This is you guys remember when I was really really picky about making sure you capitalized things back in uh, Gen Chem and didn't capitalize elements because Br2 can mean that's a, as a case where it actually could be either. We don't want to say B lowercase r2 because that's bromine. We want to say B capital R2 because that's the trialkyl borane. And that would give us the anti Markovnikov reaction. And if you were curious, and it's the exact same steps as before. So then it's um, H2. O2 in, uh, in sodium hydroxide. Right, where that was that was the second step. So technically and then should have done that up here, but I lost my chance and Zoom annotations do not allow me to go back and change the text box once I put it in there, so I can't go back and correct that. All right, so I think most of these were multi step reactions. Um, they can, a lot of them could be done could probably be done a few different ways. Um, one of the first things you always want to look at, though, one of those things that's going to limit the number of possibilities you have and kind of allow you to focus in in one area is knowing if you need to add or remove carbons. Right, because we only have one reaction that removes carbons, and that was ozonolysis. We only have one reaction that adds carbons, and that's using using an alkyne as a nucleophile. Right, so anytime you're trying to get to something that has a different number of carbons than what you started with, you know you have to make an alkyne and then use it as a nucleophile. Right, so for A, for E and for F, those are all reactions where you're going to have to do that. All right, so I will leave the others. I guess we'll do one where we have to change the number of carbons and then we'll move move on for now. Uh, these ones, these ones are all one step synthesis, I believe, right? Just review of al of alkenes. These ones shouldn't have been too tricky. So I don't think any of these required more than one step. So these are probably the hardest ones. Most difficult thing about page two is just that it writes things a little differently from time to time, right? But they're saying the same thing. All right, so anybody have one in particular you guys want to look at for these synthesis reactions? Uh, 
E and F were a little bit tricky. Number eight. Oh, yes, um, on lab. Thanks um, for reminding me. Um, we will definitely look at that. So I just, let's talk about E and F real quick because this, these are the ones where we need to get specific about which stereoisomers we make. Um, and we can, if we remember the adding bromine, if we want to add bromines to opposite carbons, not the same carbon, and we want to do it in, and specifically make it an anti-addition is what's going to give us the two, the, the two opposite stereoisomers, the bromine pointed up on one and the bromine pointed down on the other, that's going to naturally happen when you do bromination because you make that tr that three-sided ring with the bromine, right? And then your second bromine comes from the opposite side. So we just need to get the carbons in the right spot as an alkene, and then we can just expose it to bromine. So we know that our, our second, our, our last reaction is going to be, if we look at E, for instance, If we're trying to make this product, our second to last product, uh, and I want to make sure I get these carbons in the right spot. So, because with stereochemistry, it's always best to be doubly sure you make everything in just the right spot. So if we wanted our bromination to come in and add a bromine to each side, and do it in the anti direction, we need to start from here. If we start with the trans alkene, then when we bring a bromine in, you're going to get a bromine comes in on top from carbon three, and then the bromine comes in on bottom and adds to carbon four. Right, so that's going to give us the anti addition if we, if we react this alkene with bromine. So that tells us what our last step is. But we only started with four carbons, right? So before we can get here, we need to we need to get to six carbons from four carbons, which means we're going to have we need to have four carbons in a row. One and that's one, two, three, four. And then we had two carbons on the other side. We need to get here first, right? Because we need, if to go from four carbons to six carbons, we needed to add an ethyl group. So then our reactant right before that had to have been our butyne with a negative charge, the deprotonated form. Plus, if we do this plus ethyl iodide, we'd get, we'd get the um, alkyne acting as the nucleophile to make this product. All right, and then we, but we know how to go from, from one butyne to the deprotonated form. That was just excess amide, excess sodium amide gets us there. So our first step would be I'm just going to, to get from steps one to, to step two, or from our, our starting material would be excess NaNH2 gets us from our starting material. And in the interest of sh being able to show all the steps, I'm not drawing our starting material. Our starting material, one, reacted with excess NH2, was deprotonated, which then we could expose it to ethyl iodide to get from two to three. So, one to two. Two to three is just ethyl iodide. 
And now we're here to get from three to four. We want to, and this is the only difference between E and F. E and F is going to be the exact same reaction pattern, except that we want to, to get this specific stereoisomer. We need to start from the trans alkene. So we need to take our alkyne in three, and we need to um, make the trans partial hydrogenation, which was sodium metal. And a lot of time to indicate that we're talking specifically about the metal, you'll see the subscript written. We wouldn't usually mess with that, but just to indicate sodium metal is such a weird, unusual reactant in organic chemistry that we'll sometimes write it out just to make it clear we're talking about sodium metal. In NH3 liquid. That was our dissolving metal reaction that gives us a partial hydrogenation in the trans configuration. And then to get from four to five, that's our bromination. So Br2 in carbon tetrachloride. All right, so that's going to give you this preferentially give you the anti addition on these two opposite carbons. And so if if all we did is if we changed up the steps between three and four, if we did the sin addition instead of the making the trans conformer, we want to make this isomer instead. Well, that's actually the only thing that changes is we don't do the trans hydrogenation, we do the cis hydrogenation. We use that Lindler catalyst in hydrogen gas. And that's going to make the cis alkene instead of the trans alkene. And then when we expose it to, B to bromine, we wind up with the anti-addition once again. So all we did was we switched where, where the carbons were pointed before we did the anti-addition. Right, but you see, it's it's similar patterns over and over again. And anytime you need to add carbons, this is going to be your go-to method, right? So, and you might need to get it to being an alkyne first. For instance, for B, we needed to turn it into an alkyne before we could then use our alkyne reactions. So we had to figure out a way to turn an alkene into an alkyne, the way we did that is we added a bromine to each side and then we did the excess um, sodium amide, right? And then we had two halogens to, to eliminate. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, it, it takes practice, but there are common patterns that we see just like those mechanism patterns. There's only really five mechanism patterns, right? that we learned it's a proton transfer of it, or it's a nucleophilic attack, or it's a rearrangement. Um, and they can be mo more than one arrows for each of those patterns, but those five patterns make up all of our mechanisms. And same with synthesis, it's gonna be, you just start noticing it's the same patterns over and over again. So for A, look, we've got four carbons on the left, six carbons on the right we have to do go through an alkyne to make the acetylide. And then we can expose it to ethyl iodide and then we added our two carbons and then we can worry about taking our alkyne and turning it into our final product. And so count your carbons and look, look for the functional groups that from the at the end we know we're at the end we're trying to make a cis alkene we only have one way to make a cis alkene right 
All right, let's talk about the anything you guys had um, from the lab. Uh, I have to clear those. There. I hate when they do Windows updates and they change my keyboard shortcuts and then I can't figure out how to do what I need it to do anymore. <clears throat> so the lab questions, specifically there was a question for number eight. And I, I didn't spend a lot of time going over this one, but it was in the reaction here. It's the hydration of cyclohexene. So we know we're starting with cyclohexene. And we're hydrating it so we're adding an oh to one side of the double bond and we're adding hydrogen to the other side of the double bond the specific mechanism which mechanism we're using that's in the procedure we know that the overall reaction though and i i do want you to when i say write out the reaction that includes the reactants as well all of the reactants not just the carbon based one so our our net reaction is going to look like cyclohexene goes to cyclohexanol that's that's the net reaction that's it right there right as far as what goes over the reaction arrow what are we re reacting with it double check the, the lab procedure, but there's really only three reactions that, that we know that hydrate and alkene, right? It's acid catalyzed hydration, oxymercuration, demercuration, or hydroboration. And they will all give us the same product because there's no Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov here, right? Both carbons are identically substituted. And we'd get the same product either way. It doesn't matter which carbon we add the OH to, we're going to get hex cyclohexanol either way. So if we were trying to do a synthesis to fill in this step, we have three choices for which reactions we can use. Go back through the lab. If you were stuck on this one, go back through the lab and look at which reactants we actually used in the lab. And I'll give you a hint. Generally, you can look for the whatever is the most the most rare. A lot of different organic mechanisms are going to use an acid catalyst or a base catalyst. That, so that doesn't necessarily narrow your reactions down that much. Not that many of them use borane. Not that many of them use um, mercury to acetate. So if you look for the more rare substituents in the procedure, that allows you to cross off different mechanisms. Um, if you see borane in there, boom, there you go. If you see mercury 2 acetate, there you go. If you don't see either of them, it must be the acid catalyzed. And then you would just fill in what those other reactants are. Um, that would, that, sorry, em, uh, Emily, were you asking about the, the homework problem we were going over? You said, would that happen twice or was that this one? Um, that was the homework question. Okay. Um, did I answer it? No, but I Googled it best I could. All right. So you were probably, based on the timing, you were probably asking about E and F when it said, do the expose it to bromine. If you already have it as the trans alkene, you'd only brominate it once because there's only one pi bond to break. Mm 
where did I put the, so we were talking about brominating this reactant here, the, the trans hexene. Because there's only one pi bond left to break, we would only brominate it once. We'd add two bromines. We'd add a bromine to each side, but it would the reaction would only happen once. Does that make sense? Okay. Anything else on lab questions or homework questions? Last chance, last call on homework questions for now. And like I said, I'll put a key up um, that'll have, and I will also leave you guys um, leave you guys feedback on your quizzes when I get them graded later. Peroxy acid problem 70 and 71 with, without H2O or H3O. So the peroxide, the peroxy addition, I don't think you, on 70, I don't think you needed. At least that's what I assumed it was for, for I mean, from oh, the right, the yeah, peroxide. the one that's right there, that I, I assumed yeah. you just used a peroxy acid without water, but yes. I wasn't sure. You only do step, so that was um, our way of doing a di, dihydroxylation was you start by making the epoxide and then you add water to it to open up the epoxide and turn it into and uh, add another OH group. If you just don't do that second step, you stop as the epoxide, okay. which is, is unstable, but it's stable enough. And that's that's one of the reasons why epoxy goes bad. If you store it, in, if you open it and then cap it, but it's you're storing it in a humid environment, it'll react with the moisture in the air um, to open that that ring structure before you can use it. Um, so any of those where that are two steps where it's one is the these reactants two is the second reactant you can stop as the intermediate in many of them um there's just in All right, I'm back. Sorry about that, guys. I have no idea what happened. Zoom just decided to restart. Um, all right, so hopefully you got some of what I was saying. I was just going through um, and reiterating that, that for, for some specific functional groups, it's helpful to stop in the middle of the reaction process. And so if you have, but, and you can only really do that to stop at an intermediate if those reaction steps are called out as step one, step two. If they're written simultaneously, like there's an intermediate for, go back to my share screen here. Um, there's an intermediate for D on this reaction here, right, for 71, because this is acid catalyzed hydration. So first step is you protonate it and then you get carbocation intermediate. But that really is all gonna happen is one step. You can't stop at the carbocation intermediate because it's just too unstable. And and so that's why we wouldn't, we wouldn't write step one, add the acid, step two, add the water. We have this written as all happening simultaneously. But if you have step one, step two, you can stop in the middle. Um, it's just frequently there's not really a reason, like it, there's not really a, a good reason to stop as an ozonide. You could do it, but, and then you, and you could probably, it's probably stable enough you could isolate the ozonide, ozonide and actually see that weird that would be a really weird bicyclic structure in this case because that ozonide breaks the pi bond and makes that five-sided ring in between where the two carbons that were connected. Oh no. Did it do it again? 
No, you're still here. You're frozen, okay, but good. I hear you. Okay. I don't know what's going on with my internet. So we'll take a break here in a few minutes anyway. Um, but yes, and so that's that's exactly what we you would do to make an epoxide. You just wouldn't do the second step. So it would just be expose it to the peroxy acid and stop there. And I'm going to go ahead and let's take our break right now. And I'm going to try and um, I'm probably going to leave the meeting. In fact, I will stop the meeting and I'm going to reboot my computer real quick um, to see if that'll fix things at, uh, at five till nine. And if I'm not back then, then just hang out for a minute. The other aspect of this is probably means there's going to be two links, two files um, for the recording. Um, so I'll post both of them, but just just so you're aware, it'll probably be broken up into two diff two videos, um, just because I'm not good enough at editing videos. Too, I'm sure I could figure out a way to fuse them together, but that same, sounds like more trouble than it's worth. I think you guys know how to click the next link just fine. Um, so. If it seems like you're missing something, make sure go back and check. All right, so the our new chapter, so that we finished. So chapter chapter seven is substitution and elimination. Eight was alkenes, nine was alkynes. Chapter 10, we're actually gonna get into a new type of reaction um, called free radical reactions. And free radical reactions are going to follow some of the same rules as carbocation reactions, um, but they behave a little differently and they behave a little bit more erratically. They're not as predictable in a lot of ways. We wind up free radical reactions. A lot of times we're going to wind up with a wide range of products um, because the intermediates we're going to wind up making are so um, unstable. And these things tend to make these these chain reactions that just go until they run out of something. The reaction will continue on until you run out of a reactant. And then, um, and as, as such, they, they wind up making a lot of random stuff mixed in. So they're useful um, for, making for making plastics in particular, but not plastics where you actually need specific properties. They're good for making like the old school kind of plastics um, like the, you think of like the, uh, cheap plastics from old Happy Meals stuff that you can't even like melt down and recast. It's kind of just stuck in that shape and there's nothing you can do with it other than it's just cheap plastic. That's always going to have this shape unless you break it. Um, that's kind of what you make with free radical reactions. Uh, and the, the key that tells us that it's going to be a free radical reaction, there's a couple of, of clues. Um, the, the one that's always going to be present is that our one of our first steps has to be this homolytic bond cleavage. So we've dealt with elimination reactions before where we wind up with bond, sigma bonds breaking, breaking apart pieces of molecules. Um, but in pretty much every case, we've got, a, we've got a drastic difference in the electronegativity between the leaving group and the carbon or between the hydrogen that's being pulled off in a proton transfer step. Um, and so because those bonds have a big difference in electronegativity, it's really clear and easy to see where the electrons stay. They're always gonna stay with the more electronegative element. And so those are what are known as heterolytic bond cleavages. Heterolytic means that when you break a bond, you don't split the electrons evenly. So hetero meaning different and lytic meaning cleaving. So li like lysis, like ozonolysis, that word lysis means literally to break in apart or to split in Greek. Um, I believe it's Greek, maybe it's Latin. Those get mixed up a lot more than you would think in, uh, in etymology. Um, and so heterolytic means that you're breaking a sigma bond and you're doing it unevenly. Homolytic means you're breaking a sigma bond and you're doing it evenly, which means each side is gonna keep one of the two electrons. 
And so now instead of if before when you broke it apart, if it's a heterolytic bond cleavage, you get a positive charge and a negative charge, but those can still be relatively stable, especially if you're talking about a metal, right? Because metals are relatively stable with positive charges. Non-metals are stable with negative charges. Everything can still have a full valence shell. Homolytic bond cleavage by definition means that nothing is happy now, right? Because you can't have, if you have homolytic cleavage, you can't have a full valence. By definition, it's going to be an incomplete valence. And usually it means that you're going to have just one electron missing from a valence, which means it's going to react very quickly to try and find an electron from somewhere else. So on the surface, if you look just at the at the shape of the molecule, it looks a lot like a carbocation. And we'll see that it actually does follow carbocation rules for stability, um, meaning that a tertiary radical is more stable than a secondary radical, which is more stable than a primary radical. Um, and for similar reasons, if you have these other electron groups around that can donate electron density to that partially filled orbital, then it winds up being a little bit more stable than it would otherwise. Um, so we're gonna see a lot of parallels there but the other thing that's really interesting about these free radical reactions um, is that these reactions, uh, so here's just showing the stability. So a methyl radical is less stable than a primary, which is less stable than a secondary. So more stable. Those are supposed to be greater than symbols. Um, tertiary is more stable than secondary. And you can look at that by, by just looking at um, the bond dissociation energy. So the bond dissociation energy for a specific bond is the energy that you get when you do a, or that you have to put into it to go through a homolytic cleavage. Right, so... So in other words, the bond association energy is the energy that's given off when you make a, a sigma bond. When you have a hydrogen atom with, with one electron and you bring it up to a carbon that has an unpaired electron, those two things are going to form a sigma bond to become more stable. And the amount of stability that's gained is this bond dissociation energy. So you know, I frequently, when teaching, teaching covalent bonds in gen chem get the get the question well why do covalent bonds happen in all, at all because it's more stable than not happening it's downhill in energy to make a covalent bond compared to having them split apart and the amount that it's downhill in energy is this bond dissociation energy and so we can just we can calculate these numbers actually fairly accurately um, we can measure them to some extent as well. And you do wind up seeing that they're all in the same ballpark, but definitely a tertiary carbon hydrogen bond is easier to break than a methyl carbon hydrogen bond. Um, and by a significant enough chunk that that'll affect which products we are more likely to see when we, when we go through these reactions, similar to, um, with uh, carbocation stability. So just quick, quick recap. I think you guys can do this pretty well since you we've already done this with um, carbocations. If we are going to rank the radicals in order of stability, that just means you're going to go through and so, okay, well, the tertiary is going to be most stable. So we say one is the most stable, three is the least stable. And same logic for B, 
All right. When it comes to stability, you can think of it just like a positive charge. And however, that's about where the similar similarity is going to end because they react very differently. Because we don't need to have a nucleophile come in to attach here because a nucleophile is something that's got a negative charge, right? Or something, at least a partial negative that's going to be attracted to a partial positive. Well, these free radicals and a free radical, I guess I never officially defined this. A free radical is anything that has an unpaired electron. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to have a charge. Frequently, a free radical will not have a charge because you have to get it from, if you start with a neutral compound and then you undergo a, hom a homolytic cleavage, that, that product of the homolytic cleavage has, has just this, as many electrons that it controls in terms of formal charge as it did when it was in a covalent bond, right? And so it, the homolytic cleavage does not make a charged molecule it makes a free radical, which we indicate with the dot. Right, so that dot is saying, basically, it's going to say that you don't have that hydrogen there. You have a an unpaired electron instead. Um, so that also means that a nucleophile is not going to come in here and attach, right? Because there's no positive charge for it to be attracted to. And because we only need to add a single electron to make it more stable, and usually we're used to dealing with things in pairs of electrons, right? We have an electron pair moving from place to place, even in resonance structures. If we have an unpaired electron, that means when it's when it grabs a single electron for something from something else, it's going to make another free radical. Right, because if everything else except for our free radical has all of its electrons in pairs already, then when our free radical comes in, it's, um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. It's, uh, it's that sock that, that doesn't have a match. You, if you have an odd number of socks that are all the same, you can have pairs, but you've always got that one random sock. And if you put that one random sock into a pair, that means something else is missing its pair, right? So you make another free radical when these free radicals react with something else. All right. Oops, that's not, not what I meant. And um, we do wind up with these free radicals being stabilized by resonance. And they do behave kind of the same way as moving a charge around with resonance, except that we're only moving one electron at a time. And so the arrows that we use, the mechanism arrows, if we're moving one electron instead of both electrons, means we're only going to use arrows. We're going to use curved arrows still, but they're going to be only have a single barb on the end. So if we do that, that's saying that a pair of electrons are moving. If we draw this, draw it like that, that means that just one electron is moving. And so we will frequently have more arrows in free radical mechanisms, not necessarily because there's more steps, but because we're showing one electron going one direction and then the, op the other electron has to go the other way. So as opposed to leaving group leaves, if we had bromine leaving, we'd draw the arrow that way, right? But bromine, a bromine bromine bond dissociating is still kind of like a leaving group leaves, but we would write the mechanism as two arrows, each that has a single barb on the end. All right, so the, the number of arrows is increasing, but we're using them in 
mostly in the same way. We're showing the movement of the electrons. So if we want to know what the resonance structure would look like here, we would make we would make a new pi bond between the leftmost carbon and the middle carbon. And it might even be better with my eraser to draw them on the opposite side from each other. So basically we wind up with two electrons moving towards each other to make a pi bond, but then we have to show where the other electron goes and it just goes to the the carbon on the right hand side. So we wind up making that that's a radical right there. Right, so our two resonance structures look the same in this case, but and they more or less follow the same rules as resonance with charge. You can effectively move the free radical by alternating carbons if you have um, conjugated with pi bonds, just like the net result of a carbocation resonance would be it kind of jumps from carbon one to carbon three. Sean, I got a question about that. Yeah. So in that, is that eat that um, that radical on the left that's in the green, that's moving over to that bond between one and two, but then is it another radical is essentially like that bond, the alkene on the right is breaking up into two and that one's joining with the one on the left and the one on the right's going to the right, or is it like that whole thing is moving over? So it's, the net effect, since we can't tell the difference between two different electrons, the net effect looks like you just wind up with your free radical jumping. But really, it's that you wind up with the free radical, the, the unpaired electron on the left matches up with one of the pi electrons to make a new pi bond, and that leaves your other pi bond electrons gotcha. left out in the cold. Okay, okay, cool, thanks. Right, and so, in Res we see this as well with benzene rings. We see this with any any pi bonds, just like we would see resonance with a positive charge, right? Because a positive charge is a full pair missing from a carbon, and this is just one electron missing from a carbon, but it's still going to be pi electrons move towards that gap and fill it up, and that leaves a gap somewhere else. Right, and so there is a more clear version done, done better than I can with my tablet, showing exactly what we just talked about, right? So that unpaired electron that started as the free radical is now part of the pi bond. Assuming we could tell the difference between electrons, we could say, okay, well, this this unpaired electron is now part of the pi bond, and now we have the a, the other electron is off by itself. But the net result is it just kind of looks like you've got a free radical here and then you have a free radical there. Um, and this tells us that that the if we look at the bond association energy, this is continuing that scale from before. And so actually having it widescreen, I think I can actually go back and. we're continuing the same scale from before, right? So tertiary is more stable than secondary, which is more stable than primary, which is more stable than methyl, but even more stable than a tertiary radical is an allylic radical. And even more stable than that is a benzylic radical because resonance is even more important than it is. With carbocations, we, we kind of said, well, you know, tertiary carbocation is roughly as stable as a benzylic carbocation. Here, it actually, we actually wind up with even bigger leaps when we have resonance. So it actually goes in a very predictable way um, 
the more resonance you have, resonance is more important than how substituted it is. And more resonance is better, is more stable. Um, Sean, I'm sorry, I, I'm having a hard time. What is the major difference between allylic and the benzylic? Um, so benzylic structure. means that you've got a, an entire benzene ring that can resonate. Mm -hmm. Allylic means you just have a single pi bond. So it's okay. basically like you're adjacent to an alkene versus adjacent to a benzene ring. Okay, and in the example we just did, those are both allylic then? Yes, that is okay. an allylic resonance structure. Okay. And it's bothering me a little bit that the these things aren't the same size. The font is not the same size. Yeah, we're going to call that close enough. And I'm going to move on from this slide before I decide to fiddle with it more. All right, so a big chunk of these reactions, these free radical reactions, is going to be finding the weakest carbon-hydrogen bond. The weakest carbon-hydrogen bond is going to be the one that preferentially gets replaced with something else. So methyl, methyl bond is stronger than a, and, and so weakest versus bond versus strongest bond is the, the inverse of what we were just talking about. We're talking about if we want to find the weakest carbon hydrogen bond, that means we want to find the most stable radical. Right, so the weakest carbon hydrogen bond is the one that makes the most stable radical. And if we don't have a pi bond, that just means we're looking for the most substituted carbon. But if we have a pi bond that can resonate, we're looking for going for the allylic position and make sure that there is a carbon hydrogen bond there because there's not always necessarily a carbon hydrogen bond there, right? Um, so make sure that you count your molecule or your um, bonds on the carbon. So in this case, there is a pi bond. So we look adjacent to the pi bond. And that carbon only has two bonds drawn, which means it does have a carbon hydrogen bond. So our, mo our weakest carbon hydrogen bond is going to be between this is going to be right there. I'm I'm sorry, what's the rationale for that? Is it just because it's the closest to the pi bond or cuz it's So it's it's not just that it's closest it's that it's it's the position that would have a resonance structure. If we go through a homolytic cleavage there, if we write, if we draw this, if we draw this molecule out, if we draw the results of breaking that carbon hydrogen pi bond of doing a heterolytic or a homolytic cleavage there, we wind up with a free radical that's in the allylic position. So it's not, you don't want to just look for what's closest to the pi bond. You want to, you want a a position that's one carbon, one bond away from the from the pi bond. We're not going to break off the carbon hydrogen bonds that are here or here because those can't resonate. We want one carbon removed because that allows us to alternate that that uh, free radical. And um, does it matter which hydrogen it, on that carb or on yeah on the carbon there? Because when there be out, two? Of, out of those two, there, regardless of what we break off, there's one hydrogen left, right? We broke off one of the carbon hydrogen bonds, and we left the other one alone. So it doesn't matter in this case because they're identical. Okay. Either way, it's going to sort of flatten out in order to have that resonance into that plain trigonal planar structure. Mm 
So it doesn't really matter which one because whichever one's left is going to look the same. Right. Okay. okay. RJ, you looked like you were getting it, and then I said something that confused you. Uh, so I was looking at that. Does that mean that there are going to be two uh, radicals on that? Because then if that, that alkene on the right breaks, it forms that bond to the left, and then there's a radical with the hydrogen. But then doesn't that leave a radical where the old bond was, or the old, old alkene was? So you wind up with two carbons that have a radical on them. It's really, we really only consider it one, there, one radical because we're only missing one electron, right? But we, we're, we can be missing it in one of two spots. You're absolutely right there. So let's draw both of them. So we have this molecule is, is what we would get when we first break that carbon hydrogen pi bond. And again, apologies, I can't draw dots very well with the stylus. Um, and then, but then if that resonates, we'll get a, a free radical on the end as well. So we, it's, the, it's still the same molecule. we would just draw it as a resonance structure. Say so that it, both of those are happening simultaneously. But it's, so it's really like that the first carbon is, the first carbon is missing half of an electron and the second carbon is missing half of an electron because they're alternating. Casey? I was going to ask, what happens if you try to do it on the end of that um, alkene? If you try to break it off from, well, so we don't really have control enough to be able to say, um, break this bond specifically. We just basically have to go off of, well, this is the one that's favored by the thermodynamics, by you know, the kinetics and, and everything. Um, I believe, that, so those are, so if this is a vanillic, sorry, if this is the allylic carbon, because it's adjacent, the hydrogens that are directly attached to the alkene, so these two carbons are what's known as vanillic, spelled like vinyl. Um, and so those vanillic carbon hydrogen bonds will have their own bond association energy, which I believe is going to be bigger than even a methyl bond association energy. Um, we can basically, we can force it to, to do that. If we took ethene, for instance, so just, and put it into an environment that, that is going to break and make a free radical, we can, we can measure the energy of breaking those carbon-hydrogen bonds, and the only carbon-hydrogen bonds that are there to break are the vanillic ones. Um, and so we can take this and, and measure the energy of it, and we get that these, these carbon-hydrogen bonds are even more stable than a methyl or a primary carbon-hydrogen bond. Um, and also, that's also where PVC comes from. And the word vinyl, when it comes to like, um, you know, redoing redoing a house that's got vinyl on the floors, vinyl is the, and PVC are both the plastic that you get when you do a when you take acetylene and you expose it to hydrogen chloride gas. If you take acetylene and you expose it to hydrogen chlorine gas, so acetylene is just two car is ethyne, right? If you expose it to hydrogen chloride gas in a one to one ratio you get vinyl chloride, which is ethene, where one of these hydrogens is replaced with a chloride. If you then take that vinyl chloride and you expose it in, to a catalyst, you can get them to all to react with each other. And you get a big long polymer that looks like an alkane where you have chlorides alternating carbons. So it goes, so you wind up with something that looks like um, with, with polymers, we usually draw them at, in parentheses 
So that's the chemical structure of PVC and vinyl in general um, is basically, and it comes from, you start with two things that are really easy to make, acetylene and hydrochloric acid, and you react them with each other in the right ratios, you get vinyl chloride, which then will react with itself to make this big long polymer chain where you alternate chlorines. Or you put you put chlorines on alternate carbons. Um, and that's that's what PVC pipes and vinyl flooring and you know, vinyl jackets are are all made out of. Anyway, bit of a digression just because I had to use the word vinyl um, and I wanted to show that that vanillic term does show up in other places. Um, they there are a specific class of reactions that specifically react with vanillic um, hydrogens, but they tend to be pretty uncommon because usually there are easier bonds to break. And when they were first discovering how to make plastics in the in the late 40s, early 50s, that was one of the first ones that they figured out they could make. And then they decided that even easier than using acetylene and, and HCl was to just use petroleum products um, because you can start with things that are already big long molecules as opposed to having to make things that are big long molecules. And now we've gotten to the point where we're using um, starches and other naturally occurring biopolymers as our plastics, like that corn plastic you see is basically cellulose. It's been arranged in a way um, that it holds its shape. All right, so let's do want to get to um, a free radical mechanisms and reactions a little bit because that's what our lab today is going to be based around is going to be similar to looking, remember how we did the kinetics of substitution where I gave you a bunch of fake data and you had to say, oh, we're, you know, if we're looking at this type of product, um, it's clear that it happens faster, right? And we said, oh, that means that that's happening because a tertiary carbocation is easier to make than a secondary carbocation. Um, we're gonna be doing something similar today except with free radical reactions. So we want to look at free radical mechanisms and what the products can be. Um, a lot of them are going to be pretty similar to things we've seen before. Like I said, the difference is there's more arrows and each arrow is moving a single electron as opposed to a pair of electrons. Um, so the homolytic cleavage is going to be the one that starts all of our reactions because you go from something that is not a free radical to something that is a free radical. And then these middle sections, when you start with one, when you start with a free radical and you end with a different free radical, those are a, a whole class of reaction steps where you, they're what are known as propagation steps. And I'll say that term again in a second. But the, the net, net result is you wind up with, you start with a free radical and you end with a different free radical. So this is our, our unpaired sock getting in the mix and throwing off everything else and leaving a different sock unpaired at the end. Right? And so these typically are going to happen in a way that make a more stable free radical than what you started with. Not always, and a lot of times we'll pick a, a propagation step that just gets us to what we know the product is, is going to be. Um, if you have a pi bond, you can get a propagation step where you break the pi bond and it looks kind of like our resonance structure did, right, where you have the you end up adding your free radical to one side of the pi bond and breaking the pi bond and now you're left with another free radical you can also wind up and this is probably the most common one is that you just wind up with your free radical bumping into a hydrogen that's attached to something organic and it just steals the hydrogen and one of the electrons with it 
So it's a lot like a proton transfer step, except instead of the electron, both electrons staying with the R group, one of the electrons has to go with the hydrogen in order for that, that step to happen. And that means that you wind up making a new free radical. Um, you can also wind up with, with a carbon-based free radical breaking up a halogen. So X is just a generic placeholder for a halogen. We'll see this happening most frequently with halogens and peroxides are where we see these reactions happening the most. Um, and so if you happen to have an R group that's a free radical and um, it will, and it bumps into a halogen, a, you know, a Br2 molecule or a Cl2 molecule, it will steal one of those pairs of electrons from that pi bond or from the sigma bond and you end up making another radical. So you can see how this would be a chain reaction because, right, because it's to continue with the sock analogy, say, so, okay, I've got one unpaired sock. And so I take a pair of socks and I unpair it so that I can take that, that one. And now my, un, my unpaired sock now is a pair, but then I made another unpaired sock. Well, if I was, you know, feeling particularly repetitive, um, I could then take that new unpaired sock and do that with, again with another pair of socks, right? You could keep going down the line and making a different sock be unpaired every time. And that's basically what these propagation steps are going to do. So you wind up with this chain reaction happening where it goes until you happen to get to a coupling reaction, also called a termination reaction. Until you get to the point where you have enough free radicals or few enough other molecules around that you wind up with two free radicals happening to bump into each other. If two free radicals bump into each other, that stops the whole thing, right? That's the equivalent of finally finding your other lost sock. And now all of a sudden you have an even number of socks again and all is right with the world. All right, but you can't, if you think about it, I actually kind of like this sock analogy. If you think about this in terms of folding an entire laundry load of socks at once, you don't know if that's going to happen or not till you get to the very end, right? You pair everything up along the way, and then at the very end, you can wind up with two things that are unpaired, and you found the match for the other one, and everything's back to, to full valences again. Right, so anytime you get more free radicals than you started with, that's what's known as an initiation. And that can happen a variety of ways. This middle section, these are all propagation. Propagation, and I'm not sure if I spelled that right. It might be P-R-O-P-O, -O, propagation. I don't remember. Um, you guys, you guys get the, the picture there, right? Um, propagation steps. This doesn't look right to me, but oh, it looks worse. Um, means that we get the same number of free radicals out after that step as before. So we start with the free radical, we end with a free radical. And then a termination step. Means that you, you end with fewer free radical, radicals than you start with. Right, and so a termination step is pretty much always going to be two free radicals bump into each other, and now we have no free radicals. All right, and there's a whole bunch of different ways we can draw propagation steps, but initiation and termination typically are pretty limited. Um, you have to start your, your free radical reaction by having some molecules that can go through this homolytic cleavage. And you have to end by having two free radicals bump into each other. In the middle, there's a wide range of things that can happen. 
we're going to typically think, focus on one or two of them. It is an A. Thank you, Adam. Um, and if we clear this, and so we can, if I show you what the step looks like, we could draw the mechanism arrow for it. This would be an example of an R group that's a free radical bumping into a halogen. So this would be a halogen abstraction. We're going to wind, if we have this, this free radical here, and I'm going to switch to using my mouse for this drawing because it's kind of small. If we if we have our our halogen molecule here, the fish hook arrows, that's the other way of saying a single barbed arrow is a fish hook arrow. And a lot of times with these, since we're showing the movement of the electrons, if we want the electrons to be moving towards each other, we'll draw it like this, where the two arrows meet in between the two atoms. So that is this step right here, halogen abstraction. We just replace R with an actual molecule instead of a placeholder, and we've replaced X with bromine. And so there's the uh, next step I had it, or uh, the next slide I had it. Um, here's your three broad categories, initiation, propagation, termination. And again, propagation means you start and end with the same number of unpaired electrons. Initiation, you're making unpaired electrons and termination, you're losing unpaired electrons. And the other the other key clue here is that if you, it, it's going to be a propagation step, if you have if one of your reactants is a free radical and the other other one is not, it's going to be a propagation step, right? Because the molecule that's not a free radical has all of its electrons in pairs already. So in other words, an even number plus an odd number is always going to be equal to an odd number, right? So a, a free radical plus a molecule that's not a free radical will always make another free radical. Because an even number of electrons plus an odd number of electrons is still going to make another odd number of electrons. Um, halogens and peroxides, as I mentioned before, are where we see this the most, mostly because they have they only have a single bond in between two electronegative elements of the same strength. And those sigma bonds are weak enough that they can be broken apart by either heat or light. Light is commonly used as an as a initiator to start the process um, because chlorine and bromine in particular, they absorb light in the near UV. And so if you expose it to the right wavelength of light, you can get chlorine to break up into two chlorine radicals. If you change the wavelength of light so it matches the, the energy of a bromine sig sigma bond, you can split bromine Br2 into two bromine radicals just by shining light on it. Um, the example I always use of this is, has anybody ever fixed a surfboard before? done some some ding repair on a surfboard they they have this stuff called solares which is basically it's kind of like an epoxy you put it on as it's like a goop that you spread on the surfboard that's got a hole in it a small hole and you smooth it out get it nice and shaped right and then you just take it and you put it in the sun for about five minutes and that catalyzes a reaction that takes that and basically turns it into fiberglass 
and you get a really, really, um, you get a really, really hard material um, out of something that was easy to to shape just by exposing it to light. This that's what you're doing. You're using light as a catalyst to form an, an epoxy, um, as opposed to needing to mix a catalyst in, and then you have two things. Then you've got a finite amount of time to get it smooth before it's hard. Um, so we see this a lot, and this is one of the reasons why plastic stuff tends to break down or get, it loses flexibility pretty fast up here at altitude. If you've, if you've looked at your, the, um, your headlights on your car, the plastic in the headlight that they put in the headlights in, in cars, at least up until about 2010 or so, um, was was a quality of plastic that high exposure to UV light broke it down and made it turn yellow and brittle. So that's why your that sunlight catalyzing these free radical reactions is one of the reasons why your headlights turn yellow faster up here at altitude than they do at sea level. It's also why you get skin cancer up here faster and it damages your skin being in the sun faster being up here compared to at sea level because UV light catalyzes these free radical reactions. Sean, I have a question about that surfboard epoxy. I've seen that stuff. I've always wondered, does it, if you leave it out in the sun more, does that do, like, does it make it more brittle over time? Or is that like, does it stop? It, at will, a it stops at a certain point. It's like concrete curing. Once it gets to a certain level of hardness, and basically you can, if you leave it, if you start with it totally soft and you put it in the sun for just five minutes, it'll probably still be a little bit soft after five minutes, but you could take it out of the sun at that point and you've already started the reaction. And because these free radical reactions are chain reactions that go until it runs out, um, until you get enough termination steps, basically, um, It'll, if you leave it in the sun, it'll cure faster, but it'll still cure if you take it, you put it in the sun probably for 30 seconds, it'd be enough to start it and then move it indoors and it would be fine. It'll just, it might take two hours to finish curing instead of half an hour. Um, but yeah, it's these things, once you start them, that propagation step winds up being the most important mechanism step until you run out of reactants. Um, and so the way we write these, these mechanisms for free radical reactions is that we, you always are going to start by writing out, you're going to write out all of the three categories of steps. You're going to write an initiation reaction. You're going to write some prop, a propagation step, at least one, and then you're going to write a termination step. And so what that's going to look like is, so when you write your initiation step, and that's just going to be whatever your free radical is that's starting things. If it's chlorine being exposed to light, and again, H, H nu is the um, shorthand for light, the chemist and the physicist's shorthand for light. Um, if you expose a halogen to light, it breaks up and you get that initiation step. You get a homolytic cleavage and you make two chlorine radicals or bromine if it was bromine, or hydrogen perox or peroxide radicals if you started with hydrogen peroxide. The initiation step always kind of looks the same. And then you're gonna write a couple of propagation steps, usually two propagation steps. Your first propagation step is gonna be the radical that you made in your initiation runs into your organic reactant to make an organic radical. And then that organic radical runs into your initiator molecule again to regenerate the same chlorine that it start that it used up, right? And so the the key to know if you've written the right propagation steps is they should add up to give you the overall net reaction. So now I'm going to skip backwards for a second. Our net reaction basically for these radical halogenation is you pull off a hydrogen and you replace it with a halogen. 
right? And that's because, and you're not really pulling the hydrogen off and replacing it in the same step. It's two steps. The first step is a chlorine radical pulls a hydrogen off. And then your methyl radical goes and finds something else that has electrons and it steals electrons from something else. In this case, another chlorine molecule. And so you wind up making that chlorine again, the chlorine radical again. So you continue the process. This process is going to happen. You're going to have these two steps alternating basically until you run out of chlorine and methane. At which point, if you start running out of chlorine and methane, you have termination steps that start happening. And so there's usually going to be a wide range of termination steps you can draw. Your termination steps can be any time you have two radicals that bump into each other. So any two radicals that you had, you, know, you have a radical there, you have a radical there, those two can combine with any other radical in theory. You could get two chlorine radicals bumping into each other to make your Cl2 molecule again. You could get two methyls bumping into each other to make ethane instead of making that chloromethane that we wanted. That would be the major product. But the one, the one that we usually draw, you only have to draw one termination reaction. And we usually want to draw the termination reaction that gives you your net product, your major product. This, let me color code these real quick. This ethane formation, that's not going to happen very much because it relies on two, two methyl radicals bumping into each other at the same time. And the odds that two methyl radicals last long enough before running into anything else to run into each other is pretty small. And same with two chlorines, two chlorine radicals. They're, as you get down to the end of your reaction, this becomes more likely because you have fewer methane molecules left. But they're not going to happen all that often. So you're going to get a small amount of ethane. You might even get a small amount of propane as a side product because if this ethane happens to get bumped in, if you make this ethane through a termination reaction and then there's still enough free radical around, this ethane could wind up getting a hydrogen pulled off and turn it into an ethyl radical instead of a methyl radical. Right, But those are all going to happen at the very end of the reaction because you need to have more radicals around than anything else for this to happen in a in a statistically likely way. So for the most part, these termination reactions are happening a tiny fraction of the time. Most of the time, you get the propagation step happening. <clears throat> and so the only one of these that we would actually draw you only are required to draw one termination step, and we usually are going to draw the step that gives us our net product, our major product. All right, so a lot of times drawing the mechanism for these, the, the net, let me go back and let me clear those. Um, the net result for these is pretty much always going to be pull off a hydrogen, pull off the weakest carbon hydrogen bond and replace it with a chlorine. At least that's going to be the major product. If you have more than one possibility, if you say, say, if we were looking at propane and chlorine in light. There are two possibilities of hydrogens we could pull off there, right? The, the hydrogen that's in the middle is going to be the more likely hydrogen to be pulled off because that's a weaker bond. But you're going to get some of both products. Your major product would be 2-chloropropane plus a minor product of 1-chloropropane. <clears throat> 
because yeah, that's a harder hydrogen to pull off. You're making something that's less stable, but there are more of those hydrogens around. So the odds that a chlorine radical bumps into a propane molecule, the odds are the hydrogen that it happens to bump into is a methyl hydrogen. So statistically speaking, there's going to be a, a high likelihood you're gonna get at least a little bit of the less stable product. And that's what we refer to as kinetic versus thermodynamic control. The major product in this case is the one that's favored by the by the kinetics because we're making the more stable intermediate but the one that's favored statistically is the one that's going to be more likely to happen if we if we give it enough time right so we'll get to a lab probably not next week and then we have midterm so it might it's a couple of weeks out still at this point where we look at kinetic versus thermodynamic control where we, if we do the reaction at the right temperature, we can get one product to form. But if we change the temperature, we can get another product to form. And that has to do with controlling the rate and the activation energy versus making the product that's more stable thermo thermodynamically. Um, clear this. So. But again, the major product is going to usually be that you make, you're going to put the chlorine or the halogen in the more stable position where they, you would make the more stable radical. And if we have excess chlorine, if we have a lot of chlorine and not very much methane, we can wind up with this happening more than once. Every step is going to have the same general step um where we wind up with okay if we have if we start with methyl chloride we could still go through a same initiation process right with chlorine to make a chlorine radical that chlorine radical can pull off a hydrogen and now we have a chloromethyl radical which could bump in, bump into another chlorine and so the net result of each of these is every time we go through this step we pull off a hydrogen replace it with a halogen Um, and so, and we could draw initiation, propagation, termination for each of these steps along the way. It's just going to, it's going to look just like this one, except one of these hydrogens is going to be replaced with a chlorine. Right? So it's, again, it's the same general steps each time. Um, I'm over right now, so we're going to stop there. We'll pick this up and talk a little bit more about this at the beginning of lab today. And then I'll give you guys some data and you guys can go through and see if data actually matches um, what we would expect based on rules of stability, right? So it's going to be very much like that substitution lab the other day, two weeks ago now. All right, let's go ahead and stop recording.